Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Direct Xbox number 22. And it's actually, it's been a bit since we've, we've been live. A lot of stuff's been happening. Nate's actually been quite busy as well. But we said, you know what, we're going to we're gonna come back definitely after Gamescom because there'd be a lot of stuff I'm sure to talk about. And there is. But then things kind of went sideways for Xbox online. Like it's gotten kind of out of control now. So I figured there was definitely a lot to talk about just in the, the state of of Xbox at this point, which is why that's what the episode's titled, because that's kind of what a lot of people are reflecting on right now is where is Xbox currently? Like, and it's in their planning, in their strategy. What what are they doing right now? So that's why I had to bring Nate in, who was already in the news anyway, but we'll get to that. Nate, how are we doing tonight? I am doing well and excited to talk Xbox because I think a lot of reactions online right now are simply simply cases of outrage for the sake of outrage while there are some valid concerns to be expressed i do think some people are just being far too reactionary they're not taking the time to really process what exactly is taking place right now in the world of xbox mm. okay okay well that's that'll be it'll, it'll be good to hear that see what you got going on there but we had a lot with gamescom which we'll, we'll talk about some of the stuff coming out of there there was the show was a whole thing i don't even know if we I wasn't planning on going through each line. I figured we'll do that on the on the spawn cast. Um, but there was still some stuff coming out of there around some of the first party games, as well as releases onto other platforms that we'll, we'll be we'll get to here. Um, that's the, the big thing there. Of course, you can find us at the Spawncast Network. That's spawncastnetwork.com or patreon.com slash spawncast. Join many of the members over there who help to support this show, as well as many others, whether it's Game & Talk, just the Swancast. We appreciate everyone out there supporting this show and others. Uh, let me, I do want to give a shout out to a couple of people here, including John. Oh, of course, Joshua Butts, Mr. Joby, Justin Maverick, the game orb, Trent A. And I'm going to pick out Medallion. Medallion has been very active. They're usually pretty much on it with comments and they're active in the discord. So I just wanted to give a, a shout out to Medallion for, uh, for, for participating and hanging out with us. Um, and I do want to, I do want to recognize Fransby here, Fransby with uh, a, a large super chat here. Appreciate it. They say I was Vamo technical issues. In my headphones here. I had to like remove them and then like resync them. And it's Apple working with windows. So that's what you get. It sounds like you just need a pair of wired headphones. I have some down here too. I just like the smaller ear, like the lower profile earbuds here. Although I have thought about getting like, uh, there's like ones that I think work a little better with windows. I feel like Microsoft has made head little headphone earbuds like this before. I know Google has some too. Um, but I've just, I've had these for a little while now and they've always worked well, but randomly, I don't know what happened. So interference or something, I don't know. But I was mentioning the, the super chat here from Fransby and I was trying to figure out if I was saying that right. And I figured you were more cultured than me, so you would probably know. Yeah, it sounded right. I mean, it's Argentinian. Oh, okay. Spanish. Oh, okay. Good, 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 good. I just want to make sure I wasn't mess, messing that up. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, let's go mouth, someone, someone says <laughs> in the chat. Hey, yeah, shout out to the Fransby. <laughs> I mean, Ramos is let's go, so... Okay. Hey. All right. Let's let's go. Let's go. So, we do have Xbox at Gamescom. It's been like I said, it's been a little while since we've been live, but so much has happened now. Just in the last four or five days, uh, Fransby says, "Super drunk." Have a great stream, guys. Cheers from Argentina. There you go. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Cheers to Fransby over there. Shout out to Fransby. <laughs> have a good night. Okay. And uh, and uh, be careful out there if you're super drunk. <laughs> Hopefully, you're at home super drunk. <laughs> So, shout, shout out to Fransby. The Gamescom, like I mentioned, is where a lot of the news has come from. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of any big, any any big releases we've had since we've been live that we would have been playing on the Xbox specifically, or any third party games. Um, was there anything that crossed your mind, Nate, before we jump into Gamescom? I can't recall anything of significance that came out. I mean, you had some. Decent releases on Game Pass over the last few weeks. You had uh, the Crash Bandicoot trilogy. You had Mafia. Yep. 
Mafia is good. If you have not played Mafia, I still recommend it. An awesome game. I liked it. I actually played it on the Xbox. I have it. I have it on disc. It has a slipcover. It's very nice. Hmm. Beyond that, though, I can't really recall anything of significance in terms of a software release. Atlas Fallen just dropped into Game Pass today, yesterday, yesterday. And I've thought about playing. I just I don't have the time right now because I have... uh, I have Black Myth Wukong going on right now. And then there's another game that uh, I'll, I'll be playing right after that that other people are currently playing for reviews and stuff. So uh, I'm going to go roll right into that one. So there's really no time period in between. And then it's like there's we're about to get in that time period where it's just going to be releases all over the place, whether it's from first party or third party. A lot of stuff's about to be hitting. And then we also have the Black Ops 6 beta that kicks off next Friday. So... We're going to be all over the place here soon. Yeah, I think you can name the game because people were tweeting about it. They did show the oh. splash screen. Oh, that's such, right. They so. were. They were playing Star Wars Outlaws. Yeah. There you go. We're playing Star Wars Outlaws. <laughs> that's happening. So uh, actually, more people than you'd expect are playing it. One person in particular is playing it way more than I thought. <laughs> yeah, he's made a lot of progress in the games. I'm a little shocked. It's a very streamlined version of it, just going main mission to main mission, but he is playing it, and that is a nice change of pace for the individual, considering they haven't played a modern release probably in over three months. Did it shock you when this individual told you they were going to then buy Black Myth Wukong next? Yeah, because I think the last (laughs) time they spent money on a game was probably sometime last year. Yeah, they're if going from... I can guess. I'd say the last screen. game they probably bought was Spider-Man 2. Oh, you might be right, actually. <laughs> That's a year ago. This person likes Game Pass actually quite a bit. Is it on Game Pass? All right, cool, man. I'll check it out. <laughs> but in this case, hey, that, that's good. That's hey, Black Myth Wukong is on PC as well. It's uh, that's probably where it's best to play it, really. But it's uh, it's doing well. It's doing well. Unfortunately, which we're gonna get into actually here. You know what? Why don't we start with that actually, Nate? Because I feel like it's it is going to be just based on all the stuff going around. There there are still some good things, but it is man, it's been like Xbox cannot catch a break. It, even this whole week, it's just been rough for this this brand. But I think seeing uh, the situation with Black Myth Wukong and then realize that there seems to be an issue they're running into on Xbox's side and this being a recurring thing, and now they've missed what seems to be... So last year we had Boulder's Gate 3, right? And that was this breakout hit, this success, that people weren't necessarily expecting it to do those kind of numbers. I mean, people thought it'd be popular... But that was like whole other level popular. And Microsoft, unfortunately, was not there at launch. And we know it came down to the Series S because they had to make a change to their typical guidelines and allow allow them to not include co-op, same screen, split screen for the Series S in order to release it. And it seems like something similar is going on with Black Myth Wukong where they're having a hard time getting it to work or something is is off with the series s version and i will tell you after playing it on the playstation 5 that does not actually shock me very much it's unreal engine 5 this game and i was thinking about another unreal engine 5 game that i remember playing that on the series s was crazy like it was like very blurry and stuff and and that was uh immortals of avium on the Xbox Series S, that hit some crazy low resolution where it looked like it was like... We talk about like the how the Switch had the Vaseline effect. It had that on the Series S version. So I, I'm kind of thinking about that with um, Black Myth Wukong, and it doesn't shock me. I think the Series... If they were just releasing on a Series X, I think it would be out now. I don't think it would be an issue. I, I think this is another situation where the Series S did kind of get in the way and, and muck up the plans a bit. And... I mean, that would be two years in a row where they they missed out on th- this like crazy release that sort of came out of nowhere. Again, people thought it'd be kind of popular. 10 million copies in three days popular, though. I mean, those are Pokemon numbers. Yeah, but when you consider the cultural impact that the piece of literature, which the game is based upon, has in China and other Asian countries, I don't think it's too surprising to see the region really just take hold and appreciate the release the way it has. And we've seen the concurrent users on Steam, and when the Chinese gamer is awake, it's up in the low to mid 2 million concurrent players. And when then China is asleep, 
you see it dip into what about 400,000, 300,000 range. So the game is doing absolute stellar in Asia. And we've even seen the reports coming out that PlayStation 5 is selling out in China right now because individuals are going out buying the hardware to play the game. So the game itself is quality based on the reviews we've seen. I think a lot of it just comes down to that cultural impact that the content in which it is based upon is so important to the region and for them to have developed the game within their own country really speaks to, you know, just honoring their history and the gaming community within China is just embracing that. I am curious to learn about the split that we will see for the Western market just to see if this is somewhere in a, you know, 75, 25 split or something to that effect sure. because it would still be very successful even if we use that to say, hey, it's all Two million. Yeah, I mean, it's the to say less, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the game definitely came out huge numbers, and it's going to be interesting to see how the sales continue to trend after this opening week to see is this going to be a 25, 30 million seller, or is this going to find a nice little cap at, you know, 18 million? So, it's going to be fun to really track the success of the game. I'm, I'm curious. Well, now that they, it's 10 million in three days which eclipses Elden Ring and eclipses Hogwarts Legacy. And it's actually the same as Scarlet and Pokemon Scarlet and Violet in three days, which is the fastest selling Pokemon game like in the franchise. So you're right. I'm curious if it runs up against a wall and it's like, oh, okay, it, it did great just out of the gate and it can't get past 20 million. Or if there's a situation where we just see it run and it ends up being like a 30 to 40 million unit seller, like when it's all said and done, because that would be, what, that'd be ridiculous if that ended up happening because you figure they do have eventually an Xbox release for what that's worth. They'll at least be able to advertise, put it out there uh, and maybe they can get it through cloud streaming then too, you know, that way through Xbox. I don't know what they, cause we hear Microsoft is working on making it so you can stream your library of games just in general. So that might just have a bit of an entry point for people who don't have like the nicest PC setup or anything. And even Xbox wise, you might not have that console, but you have your Fire Stick TV and you're, you know, often running that way. This is, I think it's just impressive because of the journey to the West. As you mentioned, very popular, obviously in China. This might be a way for people to just kind of learn of this for the first time and maybe look into some more of that, like just that the background of history around that. Um, it's very interesting stuff, but there is definitely, it's so funny. I'm playing it and I, I certainly notice things that remind me of Dragon Ball at times. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's hilarious. But I'm like, I, you get a, you have a poll, obviously a staff that you're using. And one of the moves that you have is one of the stances. You have different stances is that the, the pole will actually extend outward and like get like grow way larger. And you just like the think of Goku with his power pole. He's like power pole extend. Just hits them for like a mile away. It can do that. So that's the thing is that journey to the West was inspiration for so many forms of media, especially with, you know, Japanese manga and anime, Dragon Ball arguably being the biggest, but it also had an influence on One Piece, which is now the biggest anime and manga in the world. And we even had a game during the 360 generation, which was loosely based on Journey to the West, and that was Enslaved from Bandai Namco. And the main character was Monkey. Yeah, I turned myself down a little bit. I'm trying to match your, your levels. You're always so low. It's like you're in the other room yelling at your microphone. I'm all <laughs> two inches away. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I turned it down a little bit just to say. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, I mean, it's a good start. We'll see how it how it is when it also comes over to Xbox at some point. But I don't know if that's happening until maybe next year or so. I feel like this is going to be a longer, a, a, a larger gap than for uh for Baldur's Gate 3, unless Microsoft really gets on it all of a sudden. They're like, nope, we need to get this game on the Xbox. And I would implore them to start moving on it and get this figured out. I think what potentially could give the game a second wind is when we do see an official and formal physical release because we know oh. the initial retail is just going to be a code on a box. We're not getting a disc right. that's coming later. And if Xbox can have their version launch around the same time as the physical version, that could give the game a nice boost in sales because I'm sure there are people out there who are waiting for that retail copy of the game to arrive. And myself being one of them, 
because this is a game that I would like to rent first, get a feel for it, and then if it does sell me on its concept and direction, it would be a game I would consider buying. But right now, I'd have to buy the game blind and hope that I enjoy the game. And when you're charging you know, $60 for a game that's digital only, that's kind of high risk because if I don't like it or if it doesn't click with me, mm. I'm just out the money. I, Especially with the return policies that we have on PlayStation 5 when it comes to digital games, you might get an exception here or there, but it's not as well as how Steam has it integrated of you can play the game for, what is it, two to three hours and still get a refund? Yes, you can play it for two hours, basically, and then you can refund it. Yeah, so, I mean, without that type of policy on the PlayStation, at least officially being a policy, it's too high of a risk for me in the moment to buy the game and just hope I like it, especially as we are approaching the busy time of year when you have Astro Bot coming out in just over a week. You have Silent Hill 2. There's so many games coming out that that's kind of a high risk for me at the moment. Whereas if I could rent the game, I can play it, I can see if I like it, and then decide whether or not I want to purchase it. Uh, I saw somebody mention they should put out a demo. I think that's a great idea, actually, for it. There's... Yeah, I think you could put like an hour long demo. Here's one. They should put out a demo. And you know what? I, I wouldn't be shocked if maybe <laughs> Sony got together and, with them and they said, hey, you should do a trial program. You know, we have PlayStation Plus premium trials. That would actually make sense. So that would be a bad idea. But yeah, we'll see. We'll keep it out for the Xbox version. I'm also curious to see if we get any more information around the Xbox port, specifically for the Xbox Series S, uh, mostly because Forbes got the same exact message back. Um, from Microsoft about it in that they can't comment on games like this that are development also apparently have deals with partners but to understanding it Sony has no deal with them so I, I have no idea with that but here's hoping it's sooner rather than later and most likely probably first half of next year that's I uh, that might be optimistic but here's hoping so let me let me go over here Nate to this you shared on Twitter X that Indiana Jones is going to PlayStation five and that it was going, I think you said first half of 2025, right? Yes. You said, okay. Yeah. You were, mm -hmm. that was a good idea. Cover all bases in first half 2025. Right. Yeah. So it, it's shown now to be well, spring people, 2025. Yeah. And people always argue, what do they consider spring, especially when it comes to game companies, because they don't follow the seasonal timelines so spring right. to a company can be april through june where whereas most people would say june is the start of summer so first half was the safer way to go okay v fair enough fair enough but either way it is it is now confirmed and like i'm going through gamescom by the way gamescom the show uh it was probably an hour and a half too long <laughs> i say that because there were so many announcements that i could tell you now most people don't remember like if i have the whole list of stuff but i have all the games that were there i, I wrote them all down and i'm go i was looking through the list and i'm like wow there's really just not a lot here that i'm going to read through and people are going to be excited hearing <laughs> like uh let me see how about infinity nikki the coziest open world game i mean i think sean has pre-registered on the PlayStation 5 to get access to that game. And, and it has 100 million downloads. I put that one out specifically because I could not believe when I read that number back. I was like, wow, are we that out of it? Like that it's 100 million users? It's very, very popular in China and the Asian gaming community. We're just not that well, target demo. What about Predecessor? It's a MOBA shoe that's out right now. Do you play it? I don't recall even seeing that. <laughs> Who made it? <laughs> I I don't know. It's just, it's, I just wrote down MOBA shooter, free to play out now. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, the bit the big announcement I would say outside of like, all right. So like, I'm excited for a new Mafia game, Mafia the Old Country. That's fun. I'm looking forward to that. It was just closed out though. We also had Borderlands Four. Hey, Borderlands fans, they need something to cling on to after that movie. So while it didn't show much, it's just. Uh, next year is going to be really big for Take Two, just in general. Like we just talked about Borderlands Four, Mafia, GTA Six. That's a pretty good lineup for a year. 
and they'll have, of course, NBA basketball and other 2K sports games. So they'll, they'll roll. But, Nate, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. We got a release date. It is December 9th, 2024. We've been thinking this is going to be December for quite some time, and it got very obvious it was going to be because November got... When Stalker moved to November, to me, there was nowhere else really for Indiana Jones to go. This is like... I mean, this is up against it. December 9th, that's that's cutting it close, but they're going to get it out. All right. Here's the thing, though. They did a one more thing, and this is, this is kind of rough. I'll be real. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this, is, this was kind of crazy when this was happening because I thought to myself when they said that, and I think everyone did, mostly because, Nate, of course, you put that uh, info out there. I was like, oh, they're really going to say one more thing. It's going to the PlayStation 5, and they did just that. Yeah, I am just five. <laughs> the timing, the timing of the announcement was surprising because I thought they would have been in a situation of we will tell you the PlayStation Five version is coming after we launch it on the Xbox and PCs later this year. And with it coming out in spring, it definitely felt as though they could have waited till let's say January or February to announce that PlayStation 5 version. This way you were able to sell some hardware, you have a lot of hype for your brand. And I'd like to think that this was Microsoft's way of being transparent of their intentions with the game. Because you finally did give it a release date. And you wanted to let it be known, this is a multi-platform game. It's a timed exclusive game for the Xbox. And I guess this is the best way they could have gone about it. And that's been... I mean, it's kind of been the point of debate for the last few days of what is Microsoft doing? Was this the proper venue for them to do this? And how do you, how is your one last thing going to be announcing a PlayStation 5 version of the game? And I think it really just comes down to transparency. And this is the only way they could go about it. Because when we saw Indiana Jones back in January, that predates their multi-platform plans becoming official. So you can remove that from one of the venues of choice brings us to the June showcase where we didn't get a release date on the game. So would that have been the proper time to announce that the game was going to be timed exclusive? I don't know. I mean, we're only a couple of months removed from the June showcase. Was it really that significant of a difference, whether it was done in June or August in the grand scheme of things? Not really, but I think it was just a matter of we're giving it a release date. I'm going to let it be known where it's releasing. And that's, also on PlayStation 5 early next year. And it just comes down to Microsoft's messaging. It's been problematic for them since the start of this generation and continues to be problematic for them as they do this shift into multi-platform releases. I think the part that surprised me and a lot of people was that they announced it here because they didn't get any chance for the game to maybe push Xbox hardware. And as soon as I saw that, I said, do they, that I, I guess they just don't really care much about pushing the Xbox hardware. If that, if that is the, the way that they're going to go about the announcements. And I, I kind of feel like just everything that's been mentioned and the way they talk about it, it kind of feels like that's the, that's the case. They, they obviously want to sell Xbox systems because they spent money producing them. I just don't, it just doesn't seem like, it's the oh, and we gotta push these consoles out the door. We gotta get people buying these things. We need the the adoption rate to be up on these consoles. It just doesn't seem like they mind if they were the entire entire generation of twenty twenty. It's like it doesn't seem like that's a big deal to them. Uh, and that they said, hey, you have an Xbox, you have a PlayStation. Don't worry, it will come to the system next year in the spring at some point. And maybe they're thinking, oh, FOMO will kick in and people will just go out and buy an Xbox or they'll subscribe to Game Pass, which is what they really want. It just seems strange that they wouldn't just make this announcement for PS5 in February or something. Like, they've made announcements before where, like, remember they did those four games? The, the I think a, two of them they announced and then they were out, like, two months later. Right? It was, like, six weeks or something for one of them. I right. think it might've been Pentiment. I know Sea of Thieves was kind of quick. It was like they announced it in February and it came out in April or something like that. Yeah, every game they announced in February was out within a three-month window. 
It was all yeah, really I, quick. They essentially had a release every month following that. They had the games come out in March. They had them in April. And then I think it was Grounded came out in May. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I double checked the exact thing, but I think you're right. It really, uh, the point is, it wouldn't have been this six or seven months of like, okay, we're going to announce it now. And then, like, you don't have to worry about picking it up for the holidays or anything on the on the Xbox when we right. do our initial release for it. It just seems strange to go that route when we have. For example, Sony right now is desperately trying to keep people from talking about their PS5 Pro, their own system they're going to announce and release this holiday uh, because they don't want to maybe undercut or stop PlayStation 5 sales currently. Even for a month, they don't want to lose those sales. It's just it's so different from Microsoft to Sony around this entire thing. Uh, And I say those two specifically because they are technically competing in the HD or, or, you know, the, the high end console gaming market, whereas Nintendo does like Nintendo stuff over on the other side. Uh, but it's just, it's so like, they're so contrary to each other with how they handle their consoles. And this, as you mentioned, has brought up a wave of, of criticism around their strategy and how unclear a lot of it is. Like I saw Jason Trier wrote, and this is on Bloomberg, which as we know, Bloomberg targets more of like the the business oriented side. So they'll talk specifically at times just to investors. And we know investors and Xbox haven't exactly gotten along in the last like two decades. Um, but in this case, he brings up what a lot of people have said is that their strategy is messy, confusing, and inconsistent pointing out three games from the same label as from Bethesda with different strategies. Starfield has no PlayStation release. Indiana Jones is a timed exclusive. And then doom is same day PlayStation release, but they didn't also, I I will mention they didn't say PlayStation during their showcase. It was something you had to go to their website and find out after the fact. Whereas here we had PlayStation just thrown up there right alongside of the Xbox release date. So it, it, once again, it's kind of like they are working towards the idea of, it doesn't really matter where the game is as long as you're buying it. Right. I mean, I don't think there has to be a unified strategy in terms of what games are coming from a particular publishing house like Bethesda. There's no reason that a game from Bethesda can't be kept exclusive. The issue just comes down to that messaging from Microsoft and how are you going to relay it? When Doom Dark Ages was announced as a day one release on PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series in 2025, Everyone kind of applauded that. That's a good way to go about it. If the game's going to be multi-platform, let it be no on, you know, on that announcement day. Let it be known right. immediately. Don't have any wondering of, oh, is it going to be exclusive? Is it timed exclusive? What's going on? I think with Indiana Jones, because the game was announced before the acquisition, they kind of just found themselves in a situation of when's the right time to do it? And we saw the game for the first time earlier this year before their multi-platform plans became official. And that would have just led us into the June showcase where I guess you could have had it in a blog post that the game would be coming to PlayStation 5 sometime in 2025. And the conversation people are having this week would have been had back in June because ultimately not much has changed. And we also know from the FTC leaks that Microsoft did pay Disney a fee to keep the game exclusive. So at some point during the development of this game, Microsoft's intent was to keep the game exclusive to their platform. Something changed since that filing. And it's very likely that the higher-ups at Microsoft have dictated down to Phil Spencer and the Xbox division that multi-platform has become more pivotal for their success and they want to bring as many games to other systems as possible. Indiana Jones being one of them, And for whatever reason, they opted to do a timed exclusive type of arrangement here. And in a lot of ways, yes, it does feel as though Microsoft is viewing their hardware side for this generation and they're punting. They're going to do as many software releases, make a multi-platform, make a lot of money doing so. And hardware is just going to be on the back burner until the next generation arrives for them and they bring out new hardware, the rumored handheld and such, and they make a revolutionary change in how they approach the gaming industry. And I do think they're going to introduce something revolutionary when it comes time for them to come out with next generation hardware. But this generation for them is lost in terms of hardware and being relevant in a global market. They can still be competitive in North America where the sales are in figures of 
two to one in favor of the PlayStation, but they're not going to be that competitive with PlayStation worldwide. So they just have to come out there, deliver quality games, which they are doing, and they have to work on the messaging of really relaying what's going to be exclusive, what's going to be timed, and what's going to be day one. And right now we still have such a small sample size that it's really hard to figure out exactly how they're going to approach this initiative further. Yeah, I, well, let me grab this. Mr. Shika says, so is there only a direct Xbox Direct or a direct Xbox when there is negative Xbox news? It kind of feels that way. How's that recently? Anyway, anyway, it kind of has. For a while there, just the summertime was happening and there just wasn't much news in general, especially with like like Xbox. It wasn't as much going on. But now with Gamescom and them starting to ramp up a lot of their releases and they started talking a lot more now, it's there's a lot more news happening. Uh, so direct Xbox, we're going on a, well, we're back more of a, uh, typical cadence now, I'd say, especially with, um, everything happening currently and moving through releases that they have planned because we'll, we'll even be doing just like call of duty coverage as well, since that's Microsoft at this point too. Um, but I, I am, I am kind of looking at this as I think you're right, Nate, in the sense that they realize that, you know, I'm just wondering if the Xbox we're looking at now, like the Xbox series. So Phil Spencer <laughs> did, did you see, you saw the interview he had, right? Where he talked, um, it was like in a, in a podcast setting kind of, um, but he did discuss a lot of, a lot of things and explained why they were doing this. And it didn't, I don't think it went over well with a lot of people online, specifically Xbox people on places like Twitter and social media in general, right? And on YouTube. And he said something that I was a little confused about. And it wasn't just me. He said, when I look now, what I see is that our franchises are getting stronger. Our Xbox console players are as high this year as they've ever been. Hmm. So they, he's saying they have, this is the highest they've had for Xbox console users this year. And that statement seemed to throw people off because it sounds like he's saying this is the, this is the most we've had ever for Xbox console gamers. I mean, it depends on what metric they are using to measure that. Are they using anyone who has an Xbox account playing on PC where you're getting, you know, achievements? Are they, they're also factoring in Xbox one, then they're factoring in the series line of hardware. When you factor in PC, Xbox One, and Theories, that statement could be true. He just says Xbox console gamers. That's what he says, Xbox console players. So as soon as he said that, I'm like, well, I guess consoles. So obviously he can count Xbox 360, Xbox One, Xbox Series. Those are a given, right? It. I mean, I, I guess if you add them all up, then... Yeah, I mean, how many people are active really on a 360 now since they've discontinued the store and... Probably not a lot. And then the Xbox One. I mean, I guess there are people on the Xbox One, but it's a sizable amount. I'm not sure. And the Xbox Series we know is uh, still trailing seemingly 30 million. It's like the 27, 28 million range, somewhere in there. I that, that statement was a little weird to me. I don't know if he misspoke or was in his mind thinking, oh yeah, we have, if you take all the PC players as well that are on the xbox store or microsoft accounts yes this is the highest we've had for monthly active users uh, i would have see i would have followed up with that immediately um the the part whoever was interviewing i'm a little surprised they just glossed over that <laughs> i would have been real curious what exactly he was measuring that with yeah i mean one of the issues with really every company at this point, Sony and Microsoft, is that they like to reference that monthly active user figure instead of install base to gauge how much, you know, interaction their brand is having. And it's been a new pivot and metric that they started to use only within what, maybe the last generation or so. And it just confuses the whole messaging of exactly what they're trying to relay. And I think it just sounds good to investors when they say, we have 80 million monthly active users it doesn't mean anything ultimately, but it yeah. sounds good. Well, Microsoft's service-based company. So for them, if you just attract more users, they would assume that you have more influence on the industry. And then they also just make more money because of that. Like if so many people, 500 million people or whatever, monthly active users, yeah, you're, you're probably making something. 
Um, but that 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 one caught me off guard when I saw that. But even so, I'm like, okay, maybe he's even just trying to just pump up some of the statistics and stuff. But then he just goes on. I mean, he just lays it out there. He's like, he says, there's a high bar for us right now in terms of delivery that we have to give back to the company. We get a level score from the company that's just amazing in what we're able to go do. So how can we make our games as strong as possible with our platform continue to grow both on console, on PC, and on cloud? I think it's just going to be a strategy that works for us. So we've talked about the, the factions within Microsoft seemingly around Xbox where I kind of wonder if if it was up, let's just say it was up to Phil and Sarah Bond and Matt Booty, if they would if they would have kept Indiana Jones exclusive, if it wasn't like pressure from one side of Microsoft to go multi-plat with it or, or something in that regard. I've wondered about that because it does kind of feel like, hey, we've spent a lot of money. I mean, probably north of 90 billion with all acquisitions with Activision Blizzard being the biggest one, obviously. Minecraft's still sizable, but like, come on, Bethesda, Activision Blizzard, those two alone make up a large chunk of it. It's time to start returning that investment in some way. And it, the, X, the Xbox platform, even PC, doesn't seem to be enough. So we got to start exploring PlayStation, which has, a, I mean, a, a large, a sizable console lead right now, just a large install base. And it's shown that games sell there. There's an estimation right now that CFEs has already crossed a million people who have bought it. That's pretty good. Like to just find that kind yeah. of money basically on another platform just like that. Man, that's the thing, is that Microsoft did look at those first four releases, and they use that as a barometer of how they're going to approach it in the future. And it's definitely a case that Microsoft higher-ups, beyond Phil, are dictating down to him, this is the initiative we want to see moving forward. Phil Spencer is simply in the seat of, okay, this is the, gu this is the guide and direction you want me to take this ship, and I'm going to follow the course you have set out. And if, if the generation had started well for them, had Halo Infinite launched in a good state on launch day back in 2020, yeah. had Starfield moved a considerable amount of hardware, maybe the pivot isn't made. But at some point, Microsoft had to be looking at what the Xbox was doing this generation, noticed significant flaws and shortcomings, especially after you're looking to purchase Activision Blizzard for $80 billion, or even looking at Bethesda and saying, we spent $7.5 billion on this. We put out a huge exclusive with Starfield, and it didn't move the needle in any meaningful way. Is Indiana Jones going to move that needle? No, it's not going to move it. Are any of the games in the pipeline from this company going to move the needle in terms of hardware sales? It's unlikely. Would Doom Dark Ages suddenly make Xbox the number one selling hardware in North America? No. So what do you do? You make those games multi-platform. You sell them on PlayStation. You make a lot of money by putting them on that platform, but you're still catering to the ecosystem that you have been able to incubate since 2020. Or we could even go further back with the Xbox One and say you incubated it there. And it just feels as though Microsoft is recognizing that with the Xbox series, they chase the exact same market as the PlayStation, and they're realizing we can't do that again. We have to be, we have to look for revolutionary new ideas. We have to be innovative. We have to come up with something new, unique going into our next generation. And ideally, that is what they have planned with the rumors of a handheld and such. If they can come out with a multiple skew approach and revolutionize things in some other way, they can differentiate themselves from what Sony is going to do of just a traditional stationary piece of hardware. So it's all about them kind of building what's next. They're trying to right the ship in real time, and we're watching them do it. And it looks like a disaster from afar because there are a lot of growing pains going on. It's just a question of, is this going to lead to the success that fans hope Microsoft and Xbox can reach? Or is this just going to be an unmitigated disaster for them? And right now, it's hard to tell the direction that they're going in. But they have to work on messaging, and they have to be more transparent of what their intent are with games moving forward as far as their multi-platform approach is concerned. So I st I'm still of the mind that if you make a good game, 
it will sell hardware. I, I, I still believe that fully. And I think it's also true for Xbox. And the reason I say that is, did you see the, like the Circana or the MPD sales results for July? Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to go through like even the software, but like the hardware stuff too. Yeah, it was what? Xbox sales were up 42 or 48%. They were up 48% and it was pretty much all because of college football. Like that one game shifted enough Xboxes on its own because it's a next or next current gen. We still say next gen. Current gen only game with PlayStation 5 and Xbox. And it it literally jumped Xbox sales for the month almost 50%. Like if there's a game that people are excited about and they have to seek out a system to play it, because if you had an Xbox one, well, you got to go get an Xbox series and the series S works really well for college since as has been pointed out to us by Josie, but also, you know, we're at college is like, all right, what's the cheapest way I can get this entertainment, for example. And uh, the, the Xbox series seems like it works well there, but the Cir Circana results are tracked by revenue or dollar spend. That just means that they were up 40% in general. And it's just college football. So I, I kind of think about it as if Microsoft had that like 10 out of 10, like there's no questions asked this game is just in like insanity. It's ridiculous. Or even if it was a, this cultural phenomenon, like we we're seeing with Black Myth Wukong, yes, they would sell more Xboxes. I, I'm not really sure why there's this weird belief that like to the contrary like i i don't believe that the xbox brand is that like it is viewed that badly that the best game ever couldn't push units like that i think the issue comes down to microsoft's internal games and the pipeline of games they have announced to this point mm -hmm. when you look at it, is fable going to move millions of units i am well, now I'm going to say probably not because it's not. Uh, although, I, again, Black Myth Wukong, new IP. I mean, it's, it's based on Journey to the West, but it's not a, a game or a studio that's well right. known enough to be like, oh, yeah, well, obviously I'm going to go with Black Myth Wukong. You're, for example, you're unsure of it. You're like, I don't know if, I'm, if I would like this. Mm -hmm. But if it was, uh, you know, if it was some big follow up, if it was uh, if it was a follow up to a game that you really like, let's say it's FromSoft's sequel to Elden Ring. I mean, you're pre-ordering that thing. Right. I mean, it really, it's hard to know which game is going to be that hardware mover. Like Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to be a hardware mover when it comes out next year. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Yep. It, it should be. It should be. <laughs> we'll see. But even if Microsoft, let's say, had the exclusive marketing rights to the game, somehow worked out a Game Pass deal. What type of effect is that going to have in the long term? Or are we just going to look at a short-term boom where the hardware spikes for that holiday, but then when we get to the opening months of 2026, hardware's back down. People who wanted the game have gone out. They bought it on their PS5s. Those who already owned that Xbox series bought the game. Or people are buying a PS5 to play the game. And the issue is, is that we're not at the start of the generation right now. Mm -hmm. We are nearing the... We're nearing four years into this generation of November. Just started. I mean, that's the, that's the perception for so many people is that they do feel as though this generation just started. Whereas the Xbox, the original Xbox was only on the market for four years. It was. We'd be talking about three. The Xbox, uh, we'd be talking about the, the next box, the Xbox right. two. Like the 360 would be coming out this November if the Xbox series followed the same timeline as the original Xbox. Yep. What we're saying, this generation just started. Good things are still coming. And yes, there are good things still coming. We saw them at the June Showcase. But out of all the games we saw at the June Showcase, was there a game there that really looks as though it would move hardware in a meaningful way? I'd say out of everything shown, the only game that has that potential would maybe be Gears of War E-Day. E-Day would, I think E-Day would move units like if they're like it's just it's just an xbox series game that's just the way it is and if it was like let's say there was no game pass not like you gotta buy it, it's 70 bucks i i don't think they have any problem moving units of that no i mean the the franchise has a reputation what we saw looks mm -hmm. great but the issue is when's e-day coming out 2025 couple years 20 <laughs> probably 2026 probably 26 yeah really. so at that point if you're microsoft and you're saying our next 
big game that could potentially move hardware doesn't come out till 2026. It's too late for this generation. You have to make pivots. You have to begin to look to alternative avenues for revenue. And that's what they're doing. Okay. So let's, let's say, okay, I, I get what you're saying with the, the multi-plat release is the point where we need to start getting money back essentially for these large investments. We have to start acting like a business as, as he did say, he said, it's uh he said, we're, we're a business. We're gonna, we gotta act like so basically he did mention something though, Nate, because I, I do think at this point with Microsoft for, for us, a lot of people, it is kind of like, okay, what's their plan for next gen? Because there is, there's a lot of nervous people right now online around the hardware. Like that, that's ultimately what this comes down to, right? Is, and I think there's a couple of reasons why people should be nervous about it. It's not just, I like the Xbox and it's going away. I, I think uh, there should be some concern from everyone since if you lose a, one of the big three, one of the big platform, specifically for making hardware, obviously they can make software like that. That'd be no problem. They would be, if they went all in on it, they'd become the biggest publisher overnight in gaming just immediately would happen. Um, but the idea of, of not having that third pillar of competition that does specifically compete in that H like that high end console market, I think would be, I mean, you're devastating for the, the market. Like, I think, I think it'd be bad. Cause then I, you think, you think any, anything then would stop Sony from going crazy with some of their pricing and, and some of their practices. I, I think it'd be out of hand at, at some point with that. Or what happens if Apple decides to come in and take Microsoft's place? Who, who knows what that would look like? So I, I think that is the concern. And, you know, I will admit if it got to a point, like how, how low do you think Xbox sales would have to get before Microsoft just went, what's the point? And they just stopped making them. Like, is, you think there's a number in mind where they're like, well, like, is it Wii U numbers? Is it less than that? I mean, I guess it depends on which metric we want to use. If we're just using install base, they probably do have some sort of, some sort of figure in mind. But we don't know exactly how they're going to approach their next generation hardware. Right. Like, that's, I mean, that's what it comes down to now, right? Is like, all right, what's, what's right. happening to Xbox series? And I think this generation has been illuminating for them. And I think they're going to do some sort of revolutionary new idea of how they approach their hardware. They're going to do something that we haven't seen a company do before. And it's just okay. going to come down to execution and that messaging. If they can execute properly, if they can message and market a new idea well, they could find success. It's just them doing things right, which they have struggled with this entire generation where they just have not been able to really communicate a single thing accurately or well to the consumer base, which has led to just a, an avalanche of frustration. I, uh, I, I think looking forward at this point is probably best for them. Although they've done that a lot in the past. So it's just like, okay, maybe this time, but if they do start the next generation sooner rather than later, if they get a head start on Sony with it. And as you mentioned, it's like legitimately disruptive to the, to the market and the concept of what we know with these game systems. I, I do like that. I, I think that could be really interesting, but my, my thought process is what do they do to shake it up to where it, it is legitimately different. And I, I have a couple of ideas. I do. Uh, some have been thrown around here and there, but right. there's I mean, something I was thinking. I mean, we can go back to the rumor that Jez Corden had put out there a few months ago of let's say they do introduce a handheld view. And the rumor Jez had put out there was that Microsoft was having those discussions with Valve to have Steam integration. Mm -hmm. If you do go that concept, and let's say that does become a reality, that you can have Steam on your Xbox, that's disruptive because that changes a lot of things. Because as we've said in previous episodes, if you could own an Xbox, now technically, at least in theory, there would be no Xbox SKU or SDK per se. Because if you have Steam, you're kind of essentially a PC, which means if they went that avenue in the present, you could be playing Black Myth Wukong on your Xbox right now. You could be playing Final Fantasy 16 next month. You could be playing Silent Hill 2 in October. And it doesn't have to come to Xbox in the traditional way because it would be a PC game that's available on Steam and Steam is now integrated onto your next generation Xbox. 
it kind of changes so, the way games would be consumed. Never mind the fact that Sony games are on Steam, which unless they could prevent people from downloading it, which I don't think they could unless they introduced their own PC launcher, you could play right. Sony games yeah. via Steam on your Xbox. This, I feel like, I have to go back and double check. I feel like they figure out how to block Death Stranding being streamed on the Xbox. Like, I, I feel like that was a thing. I had to double check that, but I think they came up with a way to do that. However, I don't know how you stop say a an xbox pc in a box or something for next gen i don't know how you stop that from downloading something on steam i'm not sure but that that's uh yeah. that's what i was kind of thinking nate with um their next system like let's if you entertain that as a possibility if they went that that's a very disruptive route that would change the industry in a lot of ways of we've always had the utopian idea of why can't we just have a you know single unified console that could play everything. I believe a developer even expressed that, what, last year? I believe it was someone from Square Enix or someone. And yeah, it's it's impossible. You're never going to have that type of unity in the gaming industry. But if that's the direction Microsoft truly did entertain, <laughs> and you have PlayStation games, you have every PC game, there would be no more software droughts because it would have everything. Though the argument and the counter would be if you are a PC gamer right now, why would you possibly consider buying an Xbox? Ah. Just to just to, you know, transfer your Steam account over to it? I have the I have, I have the answer for that actually. So here's how I would go about doing this. And this is I don't know even how possible some of this stuff is, but it's not my job to figure it out. There's a lot of smart people at Microsoft to do it. So the I I I get what you're saying with Steam. And in fact, that would be one of the major things I would approach. I would actually probably even try to partner with Valve if I could. Um, but the, the thing with the Xbox is it's already like, it already runs on windows. It's already unified within Microsoft basically. Um, but some of the advancements right now that are happening with dedicated chips on board for like uh, laptops and, and other things when it comes to AI and yes, integrating with the OS, but doing things that are really impressive when it comes to upscaling, for example, I kind of think I don't know if anyone out there is like, well, I need 8K, but I like I'm pretty content with 4K as the roof for visuals right now. Uh, mostly because we haven't even really conquered that at this point. And maybe next generation we do, like talking like PlayStation 6 and stuff. But I feel like if they have that, utilizing the advanced upscaling techniques that are already super impressive in like low-powered ARM chips, but it's the more capable device. And the thing I was trying to figure out with this, Nate, is if you download Steam on an Xbox, right, you will be, how much, do, what's what's the advantage, what's the big drawing factor for a console as opposed to a PC when you download a game? Like when you go into a game on your PC, what do you have to start doing immediately? Oh, you have to start checking all the boxes to get performance, resolution, everything like that, because you want it to run the best it can on the rig you're using. Right. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, well, that's that's why people buy. Like, there's always the question. And I see it all the time. Why don't you just get a PC to people who are mostly console gamers? And I'll tell you, as somebody who uh, worked retail for a long time at like the the, the customer level when they were looking at a, a gaming PC or a console they just don't want to deal with all this stuff in PC. And it's no matter what you tell them, you could tell them there is a magical button in that PC you press and everything just works. They're like, yeah, but I do spreadsheets on that all day. I don't, I don't feel like doing that. But that's it. They just, they just want a console controller, turn it on. It works convenience overall. So I thought about, it, I said, you know, with an Xbox, this PC Xbox, which if I'm Microsoft, by the way, I would develop one box and it's just called Xbox, nothing else. No Xbox Series, this or whatever. It's just called Xbox. You have a handheld as well. It's just a, a portable device you can buy as a companion. Um, so they'll have two systems, technically two SKUs. But the big factor here is that your Xbox would have Steam on it and they would utilize AI to eliminate anything when it comes to system requirements or changing your settings around. Basically, it would be able to check the game that you're downloading, right? See the system requirements and figure things out for you so that you never have to look at any of that. And you can just say, I want performance or I want like a fidelity mode. And that's just built on a system level. 
So you, you can go into your options on your Xbox and say, I want all my games to run in a quote unquote performance mode, or I want it all to run on a fidelity mode. And it will figure out those settings on the fly for you. So you never have to look at them, even though it's all coming from Steam. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, definitely a good option for them to consider if they went this path. And even allow the user to say, if I want to have that level of customization where I want to go in, I want to tinker with the drivers, I want to tinker with all the settings, you have that option available to you. But by default, it's just going to run at the best the hardware in question can run the game. So you have that plug and play convenience that a console gives you now. I mean, if I'm Microsoft, that's definitely an avenue I would be considering because I don't know if the industry would really be ready for something like that. Because Here's this thing. A company like Sony off guard of, wait, our games are on yeah. that platform that we technically don't have to approve. It's just right. there. Like, oh, this changes things. This changes a lot of things. And now we, maybe that's when Sony sits down and says, we have to do a PC launcher because we can't put our games on Steam anymore. The interesting thing is there are already like apps and stuff. Like I see some people in the chat saying that like you can already do that with the I think NVIDIA's app, but uh, it is it is still kind of limited. And so, for example, using AI, it can basically read a lot of the stuff and kind of interact with you, obviously, through like uh, chat and stuff. But it's able to more personalize the stuff to you specifically, and it would be something I'm sure they can upgrade or update on the fly as well as they go along with different updates for your system. That's kind of what I was thinking. If you bridge the gap between PC and console in that way while still utilizing the freedom of a PC. Think about it. You can take advantage of all the Steam deals that pop up, the early access stuff. That's one of the reasons Towerborn is going to Steam first is because it's just much more fluid with the updates through early access as opposed to doing like lot check and all kinds of madness on the console. But it wouldn't matter then because it would just, whatever, I'll just fire up Steam and maybe they can have it so that it all integrates into your Xbox library so you don't even have to up open Steam. It's just all there. I mean, that would be the thing. Like right now, you'd be playing Deadlock on your Xbox. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's what I mean. That's that. I think that's a good path, though. I think that's an interesting... It's a tough idea. path to navigate, and I think it would really take them... You have to execute it perfectly. There can't be any waffling of any kind. And, I mean, they still would run into the issue of how do we communicate our multi-platform releases? Because at that point, you would expect a lot more is going to go multi-platform. They've already committed that more games are going to go multi-platform. So they still have to work on that communication. But it would definitely have more people invested in the Xbox ecosystem than what you currently have with the Xbox series. So, I mean, next generation for Xbox may be that make or break moment for them as far as hardware is concerned. But at that point, we're talking about what the Xbox's future for hardware come, you know, 2034. And, you know, I'm not going to worry about something 10 years from now. I turn my mic down. I get I get very, uh, very loud sometimes. I'm sorry. Uh, it was that Nick Robbins. <laughs> they said we need to get you a new mic, Nate. The mic is Everyone, fine. Want, it's an it's audio technica. Seven Bs. Maybe get you one of these nice radio mics. It's an AT2020. Oh, see, it's already four years old. It's not the year it came out. <laughs> it's the model number. <laughs> uh, Do I have to hang it upside down or something? Is that, what is the right side? Are you talking to like the wrong side? Is it omnidirectional no. or is it like one side? No, <laughs> hey, I've one side. Like, the wrong side of it or something. <laughs> no, it has one side. It shows the monitor and the headset volume for me to listen. That's the side you speak into. It's on a stand. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, now I can't hear you. I don't know what you just did. You can't hear, hear me now? Yes, you're breaking. Like, you're all staticky. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, so... We'll work on Nate, this new microphone and get a cool new microphone. <laughs> That's I uh I like the idea. Okay, we're good. It's my mic connection. 
I like the idea of Xbox exploring something new for the next generation. I actually think at this point, they might as well start planning for it. It's, I think there was an analyst that uh, released their prediction or their, their belief that it's five to one right now, PS5 to Xbox. So time to start planning 2026 launch. Five to one. They think it is. Yeah. That seems way too, I mean, we know the, we know PS5 is at what, 61 million? Let me double check because I think it might have just been in certain regions. Because I mean, I would say the Xbox only sold 12 million systems, which we know isn't true. Oh, Al sold in the last quarter. Okay, that would make more sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, we see the numbers where it's like Xbox down 44%, 30%, those kinds of things. So it, that does make sense when it's like, yeah, it has outsold a five to one recently. It's like, yeah, okay. Well, I could see that. So, and we're going to, we'll see the PS5 Pro, I guess, soon, which we did get new Xbox SKUs, by the way. You excited, you excited Nate? Yes. We I have for the new Xbox SKUs is palpable. Uh, this, again, this has been, it's been a rough week. The Xbox Series X Galaxy Edition, it's a two terabyte model. It is $600. <laughs> Yep. Then, then there's the all digital Series X. It's four hundred and fifty dollars for the one terabyte. There's a three hundred fifty dollar Xbox Series S at one terabyte. But we have now, we we've made it. We're back to the six hundred dollar console, and it's coming out October fifteenth. So, who who exactly is that system for? I'm not sure because it's if you get an Xbox Series X for even if you get it for five hundred dollars, which you can find deals on them pretty consistently. I mean, for the extra hundred bucks, you could buy an external hard drive and just move games back and forth. So maybe they like the Galaxy paint job. I don't know. <laughs> I'm really not I sure. Just, like, I, every even when they announced them back in June, I just don't understand who this is catering to. I guess they're hoping some current series owners will buy one of these as an upgrade to their current Series S or Series X because there's not going to be anyone who's interested in the brand who has waited four years to buy an Xbox Series X say, ooh, I'm going to buy that one for $600. Or is going to say, I'm going to buy the all digital one and give myself less features and options. Yeah, we're going the wrong way with these prices. Usually this would be the time where we're talking about how the, the pricing is down, they've cut prices, and this is great. And like, we're, we've actually gone up $100 here. That's actually impressive. <laughs> All for a little more SSD space. And correct me if I'm wrong, I believe these now have Wi-Fi 6 support. I believe they upgraded the Wi-Fi. Well, people were talking about the like the the chips inside. They're all still the same. Like, obviously, still same fabrication. I think some were thinking they might drop like six nanometers. There's no real need to at this point. Uh, and yeah, I believe it had, I believe it does have a new Wi-Fi. Remember we had that that the leak from the FTC come out and we thought we were going to get all kinds of stuff with the uh, the Brooklyn one, but it it doesn't look like that's the case. Like I I was waiting for that controller, and we still don't have it. I was really hoping that controller would come out. I was hoping for the haptics controller, and nothing's yep. happened on that front. That's the thing that's been left behind. Although they did, again, they did mention new. They said there was going to be some hardware stuff this holiday. Is this it? Like they seemed really excited about it. I mean, based on how Sarah Bond worded it, it kind of implied as though there was something of greater significance that they were excited to talk about this holiday. But the fact that these systems are coming out during the holiday season would kind of make me believe this was maybe what they were referencing. And if they thought this was going to excite anybody, that kind of explains a lot about what's going on at Xbox right now. It's so kind of nobody shame. is excited for this. Yeah, I, I think it looks I think the Galaxy like shell looks cool. I wouldn't mind having that on remember my Xbox Series remember X. Remember last year when Microsoft made little outer shell magnet things? They put out three of them. They put out Arctic camo, camo, and it's a Starfield. fun 30 days. <laughs> and then they just never made them again. <laughs> it's like, oh, you have a cool line of product here. You can do a bunch of different themes. No. We did. That was a fun idea, actually. That was actually a cool thing too. You got the um the Starfield Starfield yeah. one, did you? High quality yeah, yeah. stuff too. And where are the follow ups? Well, 
why aren't you making them for your big games? Like you should have had one Hellblade 2 themed back in May. You should have an Indiana Jones themed one oh. coming out in December. You should have a Starfield oh, Shattered Space one for September. A vow for early next year. Why are you not capitalizing on the games coming out by making these skins or jackets, whatever they marketed them as, and selling them? People will buy them. Instead, you make little jackets for controllers and hats and <laughs> turtlenecks and such. Well, I mean, they talk about hardware, right? Like, it. They could have been talking about a new appliance. We have the the toaster. We have the fridge. Maybe What's they next can a blender or the blender, a blender, or a that. vacuum. Well, we have like the PS Five vacuum, right? That's what people were saying that looked like was a vacuum. I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'd like to think that that controller is still lined up somewhere, and that's new hardware. But maybe it's just nothing. <laughs> it feels like, a, oh, I thought you'd be excited for the two terabyte Galaxy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you think we'd be excited for that? Well, We're not sure when we look back at it, but yeah, they just have so many weird type of products and they release a new controller, I swear, every other week. Yeah, they do a lot. Like they have the Skyline Blue one. That one actually looked kind of cool. It was like a ghost transparent plastic, but I have like four or five Xbox controllers that I don't really need anymore. <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> But have you bought your controllers a pair of sweatpants or a jacket? I would have got the jacket just to make a video on it. Like, and I would have been dead serious unboxing the thing, dead serious dressing up the controller, and then putting it on the shelf and never using it again. <laughs> or no, maybe, no, you know what I'd do? I'd get like, on the shelf here, I'd get like a little coat hook and like the, uh, to see if I could find like a tiny little like uh, like oh hanger and just God. put it up there. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, it's, uh that, that was some strange stuff they come up with there. <laughs> I mean, I get the yeah. idea is to just kind of be funny about it, I guess, but it's uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting stuff. They do release a lot of interest, is interesting accessories. <laughs> well, I mean, at this point, what's the so Forza Horizon Five? I I believe that's the next one. People are believing would be the next big announcement for. PlayStation. And I will admit if Forza goes to PlayStation, that is kind of a big one because that's Forza has been with Xbox since the beginning. Since 05, 04 on the original Xbox. Yeah. So I that, mean, that one would be like, Ooh, okay, there we go. It's happening. Hail gears Forza. But it really depends. I think when you look at, let's say Forza horizon five is one of the next ones. Let's say it comes out later this year, just to give it a timetable. If it comes three years after it had come out on the Xbox series, is it really that significant of a loss? Because it's going to come out on the PlayStation. It's going to do well because Sony really doesn't have a game in that vein. So oh, it definitely no well. competition. So it'll sell exceptionally well. And now let's say in 2025, Forza Horizon 6 comes out, but it's not day and date with the PlayStation 5. That's confusing. That's weird. It is confusing, and that would be one of those opportunities where Microsoft would have to come out and say, Forza Horizon 6 comes to PlayStation 5 in 2026, just so they have that transparency and people don't ask questions every single week about, what about this game? But if the game did come over three years later, I just kind of view that as a cool. It's on PlayStation 5, a lot of, a lot of people can now enjoy it on that platform it's probably going to sell a couple million copies and Microsoft is going to take that revenue and say, sweet, something for us to consider in the future. Well, I mean, if it, we, I like to assume the revenue would help them build more games, but they also have some pretty sweet bonuses over there. So who knows? <laughs> who really knows? <laughs> like for the executives, <laughs> who really knows what happens with that then? But uh, either way, Microsoft is, uh, has plenty of money so they can develop Forza Horizon 6 if they'd like. It would just be, I'll admit, seeing the Forza logo there, I'd be like, oh, wow, times really have changed. Okay. Okay. I guess just bring up Halo. <laughs> Let's do it. I mean, I think, what was it? Jez and our Tom Warren had the report about Project Latitude, and they had listed a few of the games that were not under consideration for a PlayStation release. And I don't, be I believe soon after that, there was the rumor or the report that Halo combat evolved was getting remade that it would be coming to playstation 
that wouldn't you'd have to do something like that you'd have to do something like that i think like i don't i don't believe you just move master chief collection over to any other system you know just go oh yeah here we go do you know people don't realize how much of a struggle that game was to get working on xbox that i have to imagine the back end of that game looks crazy <laughs> like i would i would be curious I, I like i don't really know what that would look like but like but like if there was just a way to have mvg for example just look what happened what's going on back there for a day i'd be curious what kind of horror stories you'd come back with because i do that thing was so busted and it felt like it took them years to get it right i can't imagine taking what they've done now and moving it to another platform like the ps5 would be anything less than like this herculean effort so yeah it probably makes more sense to just remake the first halo like almost from scratch basically i mean they have the idea the story probably a lot of assets and stuff they can use but just remaking it and setting it up for release on i would say everything playstation nintendo's next system pc whatever xbox ends up being in 2026 or whatever 2027 and uh, yeah i say you just do that and put it everywhere and see what happens Halo multi-platform, but that would, that would be a, that would be a big one if that happened, just because I still look at Halo and I still get Master Chief as like the Xbox mascot, like the Xbox mascot. So that would be the one that if it happened would probably be the biggest sticker shock, I'd say. Potentially. I think it would depend on really how they approached it. I do want to bring this up, Nate. Um, as we finish up here, we're, we're going to do a, an after show for a bit with some of the the, the patron, Patreon members. So if you guys want to check that out, we'll be live there probably in like 15 minutes or so. Uh, but I did want to finish up with this, Nate. There was something else that Phil Spencer said at the end of this quote here. And he said, the last thing I'll say is that I think as an industry right now, there's a lot of pressure on the industry. It's been growing for a long time, and now people are looking at ways to grow further. I think us as fans, as players of the games, we just have to anticipate that there's going to be more change in how some of the traditional ways that games were built and distributed. That's going to change. It's going to change for all of us. By the end result, it has to be better games that more people can play. If we're not focused on that, I think we're focused on the wrong things. So for us as Xbox, the most important things are the health of Xbox, health of our platform, and the health of our growing games. So he does mention the industry at large here, but realistically, the the other two companies he would really be referring to when it comes to distribution of games in terms of their platforms would be Nintendo and Sony. And everything I'm seeing right now doesn't... I kind of feel like what we're seeing right now happen at Microsoft is specifically an Xbox problem. I know Sony has been playing around with PC and Nintendo's played around with mobile, but the idea that Microsoft is putting stuff on PlayStation currently and switch like first party games, even like sea of thieves is them getting ahead of the curve because Nintendo's going to move Mario over to a PlayStation or an Xbox, or Sony's going to move the last of us part three over to Xbox or something I, I just, it doesn't, to me, it just doesn't align. And I, I kind of just see this as a situation Microsoft has worked themselves into over the last two generations. Yeah, Microsoft worked themselves into the situation really with the Xbox One being a failure. And I think a lot of that stuff on that is kind of referring to Sony more than Nintendo because the way Nintendo operates is very different from Microsoft and Sony. Nintendo games cost significantly less. We know they have their budgets more under control. Tears of the Kingdom, arguably the biggest release for this generation from Nintendo, likely pales in comparison to something like Spider-Man 2, which costs $300 million to develop. Oh, yeah. So I think it's mostly referring to Sony. And Sony dabbling in PC releases is definitely their way of saying, we have to make a pivot of our own to a certain degree. But if the budgets of their games continue to go up, if those climb, PC, even the way they approach PC releases, is going to have to be reevaluated. Are they going to do that three, six, or 12 month window? Or are they going to change and they start bringing more games like Helldivers 2 and such, or even Concord, as day one games, but not just multiplayer games, but also single player based games? They're, they're evaluating their situation. It's just Microsoft is doing it first. They're being more proactive for once. And they're kind of recognizing that the industry is unstable. Budgets are out of control. 
a single bad release can sink an entire company, especially on the third party or the indie scene. They're recognizing that. They have to do a lot of work on their own, as we've seen them do numerous closures of studios. So they're trying to get themselves a little more stable and set for what the future of the industry potentially could look like. And maybe it'll work out for them. Maybe it won't. Sony is dabbling. Nintendo, Nintendo's diversifying in different ways. Nintendo's diversifying with museums and theme parks and movies and Lego sets and such stuff like that. They're going more for that toy and entertainment company, whereas Microsoft is trying to diversify by being a software company, and Sony is exploring their options. It's going to be a really interesting next 10 years to see how the industry does evolve and how it changes to just the uncertainty of the environment within the gaming industry as a whole. And I think a lot of companies like Sony, they are taking a cue from the Chinese market. They're recognizing the growth there and the potential there, especially due to Black Myth Wukong's success. And they're going to try to tap into that market, which is very difficult to do due to regulations and such. But Sony's trying to diversify. And I think that's what Phil Spencer was trying to relay is that we, every company in the industry right now, the way we distribute games, we have to diversify what we are doing. And we're all going to go about it in different ways, but hopefully we all find success because it seems as though Phil Spencer, based on his comments, wants the industry to thrive, whether that's just with Xbox, Nintendo, Sony. He wants everyone to find success and find enjoyment by playing video games because he views the industry and the community as one. And he has high hopes for the industry, even if the Xbox continues to struggle and fail at what they're doing. Hey, they get that handheld going, they'll be okay. That's all it needs. You need a handheld? Maybe. Box. I do. I do. I, th I think at this point, you can sell, like, so with Sony, we mentioned the PC stuff. I think they could go day one single player on PC along with their console, and they'd be fine with console sales because they've worked their way into being kind of the default system at this point. Like, they are the system that people just buy like is was a video game yeah it's playstation back in the day it used to used to be called any system in nintendo you'd have like the playstation on the ground in your living room mom be like move that nintendo so i can vacuum i guess what it was now it's kind of like playstation is synonymous with it nintendo again their own kind of thing now with the 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 hybrid system but in terms of console box that you put on your tv it's it's play like playstation it tends to be what people just call things now uh, so I think they could do that because they are like the default. But I do think you can kind of sell a generation now because the big games that people play are these Fortnites and Call of Duties that are, for the most part, on a bunch of different systems. You can sell a generation on a concept. And I think that concept is going to mostly be convenience. So I, I think when you see something like the Switch do it with its with its hybrid nature that more or less conforms to people's lives, how they want to play, I think something like that shows like when people go, oh, you know what? I don't mind playing Witcher 3 at half the frame rate in like 540p. Doesn't matter. I can actually I can play it on the go uh, because I, I travel for work and this is just easy for me. Um, I, I think when you have that concept down, it really doesn't necessarily matter if your game's or why they available or not, because people just want the experience of that hardware. So I think exclusives still help. I think that Nintendo shows it time and time again, especially with the Switch. And uh, I I think Microsoft just needs to figure out their path. Do they want to go fully multi-platform? Um, how are they going to approach this if they do have this interesting box that can access Steam, then other apps, uh, then a handheld? So I'm very curious about their next gen. And it's funny that we're. it feels like we're not even... People say we haven't started this generation yet. And now it's like, okay, what's what's Xbox's next gen system going to be? Because that's what they're looking towards, even though this one hasn't started yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing. They really, they have to be looking towards the future. And they did say as much back in June of we have new hardware. It's going to be the biggest leap in hardware history, or however Sarah Bond had phrased it. And I do hope a handheld is there because. That, as you said, like there's a generation of gamers and kids coming up right now with the Switch and mobile phones. 
that the only way they know how to consume this media form is via a portable system or a mobile platform. And I think even Sony going into their next gen, I wouldn't be shocked if they're even eyeing a portable SKU. They've had huge success with the portal, but they have to learn. You don't make a dedicated handheld like a Vita. You have to make a complementary handheld that would play the same library as games as your traditional home console. Because ultimately a hybrid nature is the future of the industry. But we'll still have individuals out there like ourselves who want to play it on a big screen with all the flashy graphics and high fidelity. But when you have that 10-year-old who bought a Switch in 2017, who is now turning 18, when it's come time to buy a new system, they might be looking for a mobile device to be able to enjoy their games. A stationary system is foreign to them. They've never seen these before. I think it was... I think it's interesting that uh, like there are a lot of surveys and stuff that'll be taken for gamers now. And I mean, it seems like the console market is stagnant or even at times shrinking based on some of these surveys. And for example, there's one that shows that gamers in general, 76% that are console gamers are above or 18 or older. So only 24% of the console market is made up of gamers 18 or less or 18 or younger. And that it's kind of, it's kind of strange to hear that because I feel like back in the day it was sort of the opposite, but we've all just kind of gotten older and moved up into that bracket. And we're not really being replaced by younger gamers who are all about consoles. Right. You're right. They're being split with phones and tablets and, and other things, you know? So it's, it's a lot more competition out there for, for your eye, eyeballs now in entertainment. So it's, it's tough. Very different. In a way, Very different. The, the current gaming industry has grown up with us. Yeah, it is. It, like, you see a lot more with, mature rated games. And, yeah, yeah. Like it's grown up with yeah. us as that demographic, whereas mobile and tablets and such, those are the devices that the current generation of gamer is growing up with. And that's where Sony and Microsoft eventually have to make a pivot to also catering to that market. Whereas Nintendo was able to get in there really ahead of anybody by going with the hybrid design of the Switch. They were able to cater to both markets exceptionally well. And that wasn't a market that Microsoft or Sony was really even considering. And I guess you could say it took Nintendo to release the Wii U and fail at it to realize they had to target both of those markets. So maybe this is Microsoft's moment of failure to realize the pivot they have to make going into next gen. It should be crazy for people to think that, let's say there's a, a person out there who's been playing games for a while. Like, let's say, let's say they're like 18 or 19. You know what game they're going to look back on as as like nostalgic for them? It's going to be something like Flappy Bird. Isn't that weird? That might be the worst thing I've ever heard remember how popular that game was back in like yeah. 2013, 11 years ago. So think about it. If you would be 18 now, you were like seven back then. And maybe your mom or dad or somebody just handed you a phone while you're at the grocery store. So you can play something like Flappy Bird. And you have those sorts of memories of like, okay, wow, I remember playing games and it was Flappy Bird on the phone. Yeah. Man, and you can't really get it anymore. So it's like, there's that nostalgic bit to it. Yeah. Meanwhile, our memories of that age would have been Mario 64. Golden right line. that's what i mean or even Perfect like if you're thinking bring it back in like the grocery store you'd like a game boy and then you're maybe you're playing pokemon yeah, you're, like you're playing pokemon. mario or what yeah, yeah exactly Tetris, yep ninja turtles things like that that were that we still sit there be like oh yeah i still love those things i wish they would put them on a modern platform yeah the industry's changed a lot and in some ways the industry's trying to catch up to the consumer base <laughs> and that's why you have games like infinite nikki selling or down, being downloaded a hundred million times in other regions of the world. Is Sean going to play that? I think if what? Celia makes him, he'll do it. Is it, uh, is it multiplayer? I don't know. Might have to pre-register. The extent of my Spawn knowledge. Spawn plays. In no. The extent Nick. of my knowledge is the trailer we saw at Gamescom with the cats and hoodies. Mm. I didn't know what was happening. Well... I think that's our show, though, Nate. We have, again, the after show coming up as well. Make sure I got everyone here. Here we go. Uh, Johnny says, Stellar Blade is my game of the year easily. 
well, we still have some stuff coming up. I'm telling you, don't count out some of these holiday releases. I think there's going to be some surprises in there. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got coming up. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for Direct Xbox. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Like I said, we're back on a regular cadence now. A lot of stuff's been happening in the industry. We're picking up again, heading into September. I think things are going to become very fun. A lot of stuff, I think, coming up here soon. So it should be a good time. Uh, we're going to head on over to the the after show now. That's posted up currently on the Patreon. If you want to check that out, there's a post. And we'll be hanging out in there. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Again, uh, Nate the Hate, of course, over there. Check him out. And we'll be back here in a couple of weeks.